Hello, welcome to our broadcast for today. Both those that are joining us for the first time and those who are regular, we are so glad you stopped by to check us out today. Great blessings await you as we look into the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah made a statement that I think is worthy of our study today. He spoke of what his enemies were saying about him and what they were saying about the Jews in general. Did you know that what they said then is still what they are saying today about you and about me? And if we will just know what the enemies are saying, it will be very easy to deal with them and use the information that we gather from what they are saying for our own victory. Get ready for a life-changing truth today. But I don't want you alone partaking of this blessing. Please notify a friend and tell a neighbor and share the link to the platform that you are listening to us or watching us on. Everyone deserves to hear what you're about to hear. While you do that, let me go ahead and make my usual announcements. First of all, I would like to invite you to please check us out on Bishop Etiola's podcast. Have you been there? I challenge you to check us out and just pick any one of those episodes. I'm sure God will lead you to the one that will meet your need. Now, you can access the podcast by downloading my podcast app on the Google Play Store. For those of you who use the Android phone, or you can listen directly on the Spreaker app, which can be downloaded on both the Android and the Apple phone. Spreaker is spelled S-P-R. E-A-K-E-R. Come join listeners from over 50 countries around the world that have downloaded close to 97,000 episodes. Join us there and you will be blessed. I also implore you to please help us share the word on Facebook, on Twitter, on YouTube, on MixLR. We're all over the internet and people are being blessed. We're also on television in the Caribbean islands. We thank those that are watching me right now on RBS TV 13 in Guyana. We're on there every Saturday from 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. That is local time. And we're also in 23 Caribbean island countries through the giant Mercy and Truth TV in Jamaica. Every Saturday, we are on from 2.30 to 3.30. That will be local time. They have been gracious also to put us on every Wednesday morning at 1.30 a.m. That will be local time. I would like to say a big thank you to those who are working for those stations, but most especially those who own the stations. May God's mercy be upon you. May God give you strategy for expansion. Don't forget also to listen to us on our very own radio station, Fresh Waves Radio. We're on 24-7. You can download that station by going online and going to the Google Play Store or go to the uh, App Store for Apple and just download our app, Fresh Waves Radio, and you'll be ready to go. It's all free. Or you can listen to us directly online by typing www.freshwavesradio.com. Do us a favor by sharing that to people in your circle of influence so they can also be blessed like you. Don't forget our brand new outreach. It's no more brand new. It's been around for long. And that's our prayers from New York City, 7 p.m. every Thursday night, every Friday night. 
They are on all these platforms that we exist on. God will bless you as you join us. Let us pray. Father, bless us. Give me the freedom to speak today and give your people the freedom to assimilate that which they hear. In Jesus' mighty name, I pray. Amen and amen. What our adversaries said, I took that directly from the lips of Nehemiah. Let me read the text in Nehemiah chapter 4, beginning to read in verse 11. And our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the walk to cease. And it came to pass that when the Jews which dwelt by them came, they said unto us ten times, from all places whence ye shall return unto us, they will be upon you. Therefore said I in the lower parts behind the wall and on the higher places, I even set the people after their families with their swords, with their spears, and with their bows. And I looked and rose up and said unto the nobles and to the rulers and to the rest of the people, Be not ye afraid of them. Remember the Lord, which is great and terrible, and he will fight for you, and you fight for your brethren. Wow. Listen to this, folks. In any warfare, whether spiritual warfare or physical warfare, the truth is that the more you are able to know about the enemy, the more advantage you will have over that enemy. Can I repeat that? In any warfare, whether physical or spiritual, the more you are able to know about the enemy, the ad more advantage you will have over that enemy. That is why virtually all countries around the world have spy agents that work day and night to help them find out what the enemy nations are up to. Now, the information that they gather are used to make their opponent weaker. This is also done in cities around the world and is getting more and more sophisticated by the minute. You know, every January, actually December 31st, the ball drops in Manhattan welcoming the new year. In, the, in recent times, for security reasons, the authorities, they set up security cameras everywhere. They sometimes even use drones with cameras to help security personnel pick up anything out of, that is out of place among the crowd. It is very rare now for anyone to commit a crime on the streets and the crime will not be picked up by one security camera or another. Even the camera on your phone <laughs> now actually be spying on you. It is a new world that we live in, people. Now there are security cameras that are even installed in the doorbell of many homes. You ring the doorbell, and what happens? You alert the owner of your presence, wherever he may be. He may be in California while you are ringing his doorbell in Queens. Even he may be outside the country. Many thieves have been caught that way. The point I'm trying to make is this. The world around us is getting wiser and wiser every day in protecting itself by using sophisticated gadgets to gather information. So what I wanna to do today is to give you some top level eavesdropping secret 
It's the secret information that I'm going to give you regarding your opponents in spiritual warfare. The information I have in my possession has to do with what our adversaries are saying about us. Five things that they are saying. And they come to us from Nehemiah's <laughs> spiritual and physical intelligence gathering apparatus. The information worked for Nehemiah. And I believe it will work for you, and it will work for me also. Look at it in verse 11 of the text we read in Nehemiah chapter 4. And our adversaries said, They shall not know, neither see, till we come in the midst among them, and slay them, and cause the walk to see. Five vital things that the enemy wishes against you. Five vital things that the enemy wishes against me. Let me enumerate them for you. Number one, that you shall not know. That's his number one wish. Number two, that you shall not see. Number three, that they gain access to you undetected. Number four, that they slay you. And number five, that they stop whatever you are up to. I pray for you that from today, you will know, you will see, and unexpected attacks will not gain access into your life. You will not be slain, and the works of your hands shall not be stopped. You probably have heard people lament using those very common words of, I regret, had I known, I didn't know, I didn't see it coming. I'm sure you've heard people say that. I didn't see it coming. Had I known, I am just talking to you today about surprise, sneaky, unexpected spiritual attacks that can have devastating and deadly effects on the victim. My prayer for you is very simple, that God will tip you off before it is too late for you. For some, it's too late. May you never join the group of had I known. I did not see it coming. Shall never, never be in your vocabulary. And I think after you hear me this day, it will be easy for you to pick things up and know what your enemies are saying. I pray for you again. Strange, unexpected death shall not be your portion. The works of your hands shall be unstoppable in the name of Jesus. Let me tell you true stories connected to my own church in New York. A man came to our church from Africa. He wasn't a member of our church, either in Africa or in New York, but he came from Africa for his daughter's graduation in Canada. And then he said after the graduation, listen, I have some relatives in New York. Let me go visit them before I go back to Africa. So he came into the city of New York and stayed in the home of a stomach doctor. And the doctor just said to him one day, hey, why don't you let me examine your stomach? And he took him to his practice, examined his stomach. Guess what he found? Advanced stage of cancer that would have easily killed him. But then he came to our church and we prayed for him. He used his medication and he got delivered. That's a major defeat for the enemy called cancer. 
He didn't know he had it. He didn't know he was close to his death. But God walked it out for him to know before it was too late. That is what I'm saying to you. Knowing what the enemy said, picking up what the enemy plans, picking up the death that the enemy has in store for you. Another person in our church told me, Sir Bishop, I just felt impressed to go see an eye doctor. Do you know he was about to go blind? When he got to the doctor's office, they scheduled him for immediate surgery. He didn't go because he had a problem per se. He just said, I've not checked my eyes out in a long time. Let me go do it. And it turned out to be, he was close to losing his eyes. The enemy was at work for both of these people I just told you. But neither of them knew that they were headed for trouble. But thank God, in his mercy, consciously or unconsciously, he tipped them off and they avoided major catastrophe. Look at verse 11 again of Nehemiah chapter 4. And our adversaries said, they shall not know they shall not see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause what they are doing to cease. Listen to me, precious hearts. The strategy of the enemy is for you not to know until it is too late. The strategy of the enemy for me is not to see until it is too late to be invaded and not know about it until it is too late and to be taken out of existence, not knowing how close you are to the end of your life, to be halted, to be stopped. All these five strategies are the things that the enemy has in store for the people of this world. And I'm sure you have seen people that are falling for those. But of all those five strategies, the first two, in my own opinion, carry most weight. Not to see and not to know. Not to see and not to know. Those two <laughs> carry a lot of weight. If the enemy can get you not to see, if the enemy can get you not to know, then he has really, really gotten you. Nehemiah 4.11 says again, and the adversaries said, our adversaries said, they shall not know, neither shall they see till we come in the midst among them and slay them and cause the work to cease. That means that if you don't know what you need to know, if you don't see what you need to see, then it will be easy for the enemy to come in and do whatever he wants to do. The big question today is this, how do I see when something is going on? How do I know when something is going on? Because if you can see and if you can know, then surprise attacks will not be your portion. Oh, by the way, it might interest you to know that for Nehemiah to have made that statement, then it means the plan must have leaked into his hands. How exactly the plans leaked, we are not told. But at least he came out to us and said, this is what my enemies were saying. So this is what I want to do. We don't know what he did that made the secrets of the enemy to leak out. But I want to show you some steps that you can take and some steps I can take that will help us to be aware of what the enemy is up to. All right? You ready? Number one. 
If you can just walk in the fear of God, it will be easy for you to pick up what the enemy is up to. Walk in the fear of God. Psalm 25 verse 14 says, The secret of the Lord is with them that fear him, and he will show them his covenant. God has all secrets at his disposal. And when you walk in the fear of God, then God reveals secrets to you. What is so sad in these last days is that behind the pulpit, there's no fear of God. On the pew, there's no fear of God. Everybody just does what they want. Please, don't join that group. This is the conclusion of the matter. According to the book of Ecclesiastes, fear God. If you don't have the fear of God in you, it will be easy for the enemy to sneak up on you and steal and kill and destroy. We don't know how Nehemiah got to know what the enemies were saying, but one of the ways you and I can get to know what the enemy is saying is to walk in God's fear. Number two, be prayerful. Jeremiah 33 verse 3 says, Call unto me, and I will answer thee, and I will show thee great and mighty things which thou knowest not. Always pray the prayer that Elisha prayed for his servant. What prayer did he pray for his servant? You know it in 2 Kings chapter 6 verse 17. And Elisha prayed, and said, Lord, I pray thee, open his eyes that he may see. And the Lord opened the eyes of the young man, and he saw. And behold, the mountain was full of horses and chariots of fire round about Elisha. Wow, this man didn't see. But the prayer of his boss opened his eyes. And what he saw was amazing. There are many things around you that you don't see. There are many things around you that you need to see. You don't see them. You need to know you don't know them. But you know, with prayer, you can know just about anything that God will show to you. God can pull the file of those who are deceiving you and show you this is who they are. This is what they are up to. This is what they are doing. And as you do that, ladies and gentlemen, it will be easy for you to protect yourself from what I like to call surprise attacks. You know, Elisha himself that prayed for this young boy thrived on that because in 2 Kings chapter 6, in verse 31, we are told, then he said, God do so and more also to me, if the head of Elisha, the son of Shaphat, shall stand on him this day. Now, he was a wicked king. He was out to take Elisha out. But look at what happened in verse 32. Elisha sat in his house, and the elders sat with him. And the king set a man from before him, but, hallelujah, before the messenger came to him, he said to the elders, See ye how this son of a murderer has sent to take away my head. Look, when the messenger cometh, shut the door and hold him fast at the door. Is not the sound of his master's feet behind him? And while he had talked with them, with them behold, the messenger came down to him. And he said, Behold, this evil is of the Lord. What, sh why, what shall I wait for? For the Lord is ready. Now listen, there are things that are coming your way that you don't know. There are things that are headed your path that you don't see. But if you're a man of prayer, if you're a woman of prayer, many times the things that you don't know, the things that you don't see, God will graciously make you see them. Number three, always pray for this grace that I just read about that was upon Elisha. I mean, the grace just rested upon him. He knew what he needed to know. 
He saw what he needed to see. In 2 Kings, in the 6th chapter, in the 10th verse, this is what we read. And the king of Israel sent to the place which the man of God told him and warned him of. And he saved himself there not once, not twice. Therefore, the heart of the king of Syria was sore troubled for this thing. And he called his servants. And he said unto them, Will ye not show me which of us is for the king of Israel? And one of his servants said, None, my lord, O king. But there is an Elisha, glory to God. But Elisha, the prophet that is in Israel, telleth the king of Israel the words that thou speakest in thy bedchamber. Isn't that beautiful? <laughs> that when they plan in their bedchamber, you hear about it in your own bedchamber, and you are, you are able to make plans to escape. What are your enemies saying? Nobody knows. But if we can pray, if we can fear God, if we can ask that what was upon Elijah, Elisha will be upon us, then these people cannot just take us for a ride. Number four, pray for God's hands to be upon your dream life. Did you hear that? Pray for God's hands to be upon your dream life. In Job 33 verse 14, the Bible says, For God speaketh once, yea, twice, yet man perceiveth it not. He speaks in a dream, in a vision of the night, when deep sleep falleth upon man in slumberings upon the bed, and he openeth the ears of men, and sealeth their instruction. You know, God's hand to be upon you to dream, very significant dreams, is what you need to pray about. To dream easily understandable dreams is what you need to pray about. To dream and be able to remember your dreams is what you need to pray about. You know, sometimes you don't need a dream. You don't need a vision and you don't need a revelation. You just need some God sent reliable informants. Did you hear what I said? Yes, you just need some God sent reliable informants. In Acts chapter 23, verse 12, we saw how Paul was a beneficiary of what I just described. Let me read it to you, Acts 23, 12. And when it was day, certain of the Jews banded together and bound themselves under a curse, saying that they will neither eat nor drink till they had killed Paul the apostle. There were more than 40 which had made this conspiracy. And they came to the chief priests and elders and said, we have bound ourselves under a great curse that we will eat nothing until we have slain Paul. And Paul had no idea, no dream, no vision, no revelation. He knew nothing. So they went on. Now they are four. Ye will the counsel signify to the chief captain that it bring him down to you tomorrow, as though ye will inquire something more perfectly concerning him, and we, or ever he come near, are ready to kill him. Now look at what happens next. And when Paul's sister's son heard of their lying in wait, he went and entered into the castle and told Paul. He needed no dream. He needed no vision. As good and as necessary, dreams and visions are many times. This time, he needed an informant. Now, the informant that God gave him was a little boy. And when that little boy was passing by and they were making that plan, they did not reckon with him. But guess what? He heard everything they said, and he graciously told Paul the Apostle, and Paul used the information that he got to deliver himself from these people that were determined to kill him. I wonder what happened to their fast. 
because they said they will not eat, they will not drink until they kill Paul. I guess they died of hunger. Thank God for his protection. What our enemies are saying? Well, there is also another way to know what they are saying. And you know what way to know that? Unconscious leading of God. What do I mean by that? You just feel a strong urge to do something or not to do something. You feel a strong urge to go somewhere or not to go somewhere. All right? That is even not a dream, not a vision, no nothing. Just an unconscious leading of God that speaks to your inner man. Some people call it gut feeling. And you know, you just do it. Well, something happened to me a couple of years ago in New York City. I was part of my former church in the Bronx. And we had two men in that church that really, really hated me for whatever reason. They didn't care about me, they didn't love me, and they wanted me destroyed. So what they did was hold a meeting on Saturday night to bring a lady, they did the meeting with this girl, that she will come to church on Sunday morning, and after the service come into my office, and then scream out that I was trying to molest her in my office. And they said they believe some people will believe it, and that would damage me tremendously. And they had their plans, they came to church, but guess what happened? I just called one of my pastors in the morning. I said, you know what? I feel like we should go to Boston to worship in our Boston congregation today. It was not previously planned. So as it turned out, it was to be my day of disgrace was to be my day of someone lying against me and it would be so hard if not impossible to shake it off because it would be her word against my word but guess what when they came to church in the morning I was nowhere to be found I was gone their plans never worked I remember this thing even though it has happened many 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 years ago it remains in my memory till today. I pray for you. Every wicked plan that they have against you, unconsciously or even consciously, God will lead you away from that plan so that the enemies of your destiny will not be able to perform their enterprise against you. Well, there is one more way to know what your enemies are saying and that is by the still, small voice of God Almighty. If God will give you that still, small voice, the Spirit of God will communicate with your spirit, and God will speak to you in a language that you will understand, and God will just whisper to you what you need to know. The Bible says in John chapter 7 and verse 27, it says, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. So if you're watching this program today, I thank God that you came. You can hear what the enemy is saying. You can know what the enemy is saying. Before the enemy comes against you to steal, to kill, and to destroy, God's still small voice can be spoken to you, and when you hear what God is saying to you, you'll be able to follow him, and you'll be able to deliver yourself like Nehemiah delivered himself. Like I told you at the beginning of this broadcast, we don't know how Nehemiah got to know that there were some people that were planning against the wall that he was building, but somehow, somehow, God allowed him to know what was going on. God allowed him to see who were behind it. And guess what happened? God delivered him totally and completely. So those are my seven thoughts that I want to share with you, that if you have those things in your life, it will be easy for you to know when the enemy is about to take you out. What is the first thing I said? 
I said you must walk in the fear of God. God gives secrets to those who walk in his fear. Number two, you must be prayerful. Call unto me and I will show you great and mighty things that thou knowest not. You'll be able to know things that ordinarily you wouldn't know if you are not prayerful. We saw that from the life of Elisha in so many ways. I also say that you should always pray for that grace that was upon Elisha. Elisha just knew things. You know, you can get to that point where you just know things. I also said you should pray that God's hands will be upon your dream life. That when you close your eyes to dream, God will give you clear dreams, unmistakable dreams, dreams that actually need no interpretation. So that when you dream those dreams, you'll be able to know what the enemy is up to against your life. God speaketh once and yea twice, yet man perceiveth it not. God speaks in a dream, God speaks in a vision. And many of us have had incredible dreams, amazing dreams that told us what God, what the enemy is doing. You know, I was in the Philippines a couple of years ago and I just had a dream. I had a dream that someone took over the third floor of my church in New York City. And I woke up, I told my wife, I said, wait a minute, something is going on in New York. It looks like someone is trying to take over the church in New York. And guess what? For New York City, if someone moves into a vacant building, and it stays there for about a month or so, you will have a difficult time ejecting them. So I called my office in New York. I said, I just had a dream that someone has take, moved in into the third floor of the, of the church building that we are not using that third floor. Well, someone went and checked it out and guess what? <laughs> it was a homeless person that had moved in and settled in. And we were able to move him out before he settled in properly. So what is the enemy planning? What's the enemy doing? What's the enemy saying? Many times God will show you in your dream. So you need to pray that if you don't dream at all, then God will give you dreams. Because if you don't dream, how will you know what is happening? How will you know what will happen? So you need to pray that God's hands will be upon your dream life. And if you are one of those that dream but never remember your dreams, you know, there are people that dream and they never remember their dreams. <laughs> and sometimes they say, well, I don't dream at all. No, 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 no. Everybody dreams at least one hour every night. The only difference is that some people remember and some people don't remember. And if you don't remember, that's an attack of the enemy in itself. So you need to pray against that. Then God also will let you know what is going on by giving you reliable informants. Not informants that you send as spies, but people who just know in the office, who just know in the family, who just know in the church that they are planning something against you, and they will come to you like that little boy came to Paul and said, Paul, some people have vowed that they will not eat, they will not drink until they kill you. And Paul said, oh yeah? And then he sent for the authorities, and God delivered him completely from their plan. That is so beautiful. I also talked about, you know, the gut feeling. You just know. You just know. You don't know what is going. You just know. You just have a feeling. You have an unrest in your heart that I think this is happening. I think this is happening. And then you check it out and you discover that it is really happening. Like what I told you happened to me when somebody planned to destroy me. And I ended up going out of town the day they planned to destroy me and they couldn't carry out their wicked enterprise. I also said, if you want to know what the enemy is planning to do, you need to pray for the still, small voice of God and to know them. You know, that brings something up very, very serious. If you are someone who is always talking like a parrot, if you are someone who is always blah, 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 always loud, listening to music, listening to this, listening to that, watching TV, you God, still small voice. If you are still and if you are quiet, you'll be able to hear the voice of God. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. Learn to be quiet. Learn to be still. Learn to wait on God. You'll be able to hear the voice of God telling you what your enemies are saying 
and what your enemies are doing. Let me close by sharing with you the worst thing the enemy can say about you. And let me make some declarations against it. All right. Here, are, here is it, the worst of the worst that the enemy can say about you, that the enemy can plan against you. And we are going to make some declarations of all the things that the enemy can do to anyone. The most devastating is when he decides to kill an individual and he succeeds at killing that individual. Yeah. They can say this, they can say that. If he succeeds at not allowing you to see, if he succeeds at not allowing you to know, if the enemy succeeds at not allowing you to prosper, if the enemy succeeds at not allowing you to be victorious, at least you are still alive. So there is hope for you. But what happens when the enemy decides to take you out and kill you? So that is why the ultimate goal of the enemy is to actually take you out. That's the ultimate goal of the enemy, to take out his victims from the land of the living. Whoever the enemy can kill, he will kill them. Whoever the enemy can destroy, he will destroy them. And Jesus echoed that goal of the adversary when he said, the enemy comes not just to steal, not just to destroy, but ultimately to kill. That's what the enemy is after, to kill you. And when the enemy tries everything that he, that he can take to throw at you and it does not succeed, then he says, hey, let's kill him. Let's kill him. So I want to give you a simple declaration that you need to be making from time to time. Declaration from time to time. Psalm 41 verse 5 says, Mine enemies speak evil of me. And does that sound like what Nehemiah was saying? <laughs> what the enemies are saying? David said it. He said, My enemies speak evil of me. And they, they say, When shall he die? And when shall his name perish? Can you believe that? My enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die? And when will his name perish? You know what I found out, quite frankly? <laughs> Lord have mercy. The enemy is always speaking. That's just the truth. The enemy is always speaking. And David's example is so classic. He said, my enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die? And his name perish. I thank God we don't hear all that the enemy speaks. Did you hear what I said, folks? I thank God we don't hear everything that the enemy speaks. You will be unable to sleep from shock if you did. Thank God it keeps many of these things away from us. David said, my enemies speak evil of me. And what is so strange is this. They will laugh in his presence they will say good things in his presence, but when he turned his back, they spoke evil against him. Now you will have thought something that because God spoke good things of him, everybody else will speak good about him. But no, you will have thought that because God loved David, everyone else will love David. But it's not always like that, people. My enemies speak evil of me, David said. And the word evil in that verse refers to their false slanders spoken to damage the reputation of David. Words that are spoken to cast him in bad light and make him look very bad. Wow. Evil tongues. May God deliver us from them. If the hatred had stopped at just slanderous words, it would have been okay. But they went further and they wondered out loud, when shall he die? Hey, 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 when shall he die? Can you imagine them saying that and you hear that? 
through your window? When will Miss So and So die? When will Mr. So and So die? You know what was so bad is this, and this is so heartbreaking. At the time when they said this, David was actually sick. He was not feeling well. And they were saying, why is this man still alive? Why is he lingering on and he continues to live? They expressed their wish. When will he die? You know, nothing can be more unkind, quite frankly. Nothing can be more severe and more wicked than the desire that a man who is sick shall die and be out of the way. You know, I used to uh, teach in a village in Africa several years ago, and there was a man in that village who was sick, and some people poisoned him after he was sick so he could die fast. Now, he was already sick, people. <laughs> he was already sick. Yet, those who are feeding him, those who are taking care of him, put poison in his food and killed him quickly. It was after he died that they came out and they confessed. Nothing, nothing in this world, nothing could add more to the sorrows of sickness itself than for a person to have this kind of wish, than to have it talked among men whispered from one to another that such a man was a nuisance, that David was a bad man, that David was suffering on account of his sins, that it was desirable that his death should occur as soon as possible. You know, I pray for you today that anyone who desires death for you will be disappointed that anyone who is wishing you to be pushed over the edge from the land of the living, their wish will never be given to them. No matter where they go, no matter what they do, God will not allow their thoughts and their plans to prosper against you. Let me read to you what David said again. Psalm 41, in verse number 5. Mine enemies speak evil of me. When shall he die and his name perish? This is pure nonsense. Do you know there are husbands that wish their wives would die so they can marry somebody else? Yeah, I, I know about that because somebody told me that. He said, I pray that my wife would die. I'm tired of her. Well, I know of another girl that came to me a couple of years ago. And he said, Bishop, can you pray for me that my husband will die? I said, I'm not in the business of killing people. I'm in the business of life. And she said, well, I will keep praying by myself that he will die. I said, that will not be the right thing to do. If there is a problem between you and him, you need to go settle it. Well, guess what happened? The man actually died. And you know what killed him? He walked in a factory. True story and he got caught in a conveyor belt, and the belt just grounded him with the meat that they were processing in that factory. And then the funeral came, and this foolish girl was crying crocodile tears. And I said to myself, foolish girl, she's crying. Is it not this same man that you wish will die? Now he's dead, go and eat his meat. Very, very sad that people will wish somebody dead. They said, when will he die? That's what they said about David. And his name perish. That he should be forgotten altogether. Let his name perish. That his name should be no more mentioned. That all the influence of his life should come to an end suddenly. What a malignant enemy David had. Lord, have mercy. Well, as for you, by the grace of God, you are not going anywhere. Did you hear what I said? I'm prophesying to you right now. We are getting ready to go off the air. But I'm saying to you, <laughs> you are not going anywhere. If you like, you can say that a thousand times after me. Say, I am not going anywhere. Hallelujah. God placed me where I am. You know, God placed me where I am. I'm not going anywhere. 
Sickness from the pits of hell will not end your life, no matter how hard they try. Any sickness arrow that they throw at you will bounce back at them. All the negative wishes will not end your life. I hope you're saying amen where you are. Because if I told you and if God showed you the people that have negative wishes towards you, you will be shocked. Your name will not perish. The name of your children will not perish. The name of your family will not perish. You know what our response to them should be? Same as the declaration of David. You know what David said in Psalm 118 and verse 17? I shall not die, <laughs> but I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. You need to read that verse and read it to verse 10 to get the real picture. Let me read verse 10 for you. And all nations compass me about. Can you imagine whole nations compassing David about? But in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Wow, wow, wow. I can, I can, be, I can pray for 24 hours on that. He said, all nations compass me about. He didn't say an individual. He said, nations compass me about. But he said, in the name of the Lord, no matter how many nations they are, I will destroy them. They compass me about, yes, in verse 11. They compass me about, yes, but in the name of the Lord, I, David, will destroy them. In verse 12, he said, they compass me about like bees. They are quenched as the fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Thou shalt thrust sore at me, my goodness, that I might fall, but the Lord helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. Look at verse 16. The right hand of the Lord is exalted. The right hand of the Lord doeth valiantly. And I like what he closes with in verse 17 of Psalm 118. He says, I shall not die. I shall live and declare the works of the Lord. You know what I guess? <laughs> it's like David was saying, I am not boasting, oh, I, David, am not boasting, but I am making my boast in the Lord. You know, as it were, you know what David said, as it were? He said, the bullet that will kill me has not been manufactured yet. Don't you claim that? The bullet that will kill me <laughs> has not been manufactured yet. You know, there's a girl in my church in New York and a lot of warfare. She's from Ghana and she was coming home one day from work. True story in the Bronx. And she felt a pain in her shoulder in the back and she just walked to the house. When she removed her clothing, when she got home, <laughs> listen to me, people. She might even be watching me right now. There was a blood stain on her clothing. Then she looked and discovered that it was a bullet that came through her back and came out from her front. She was afraid. She called the, doc, the ambulance. The ambulance took him to the hospital. When she got to the hospital, true story, when she got to the hospital, the doctor said, whoever the God is that you are worshiping, you better keep on worshiping him because it's God who saved you by less than an inch from this bullet cutting a very big blood artery that will have killed you. She came back home. She came to church and we all danced and gave God the glory. Listen, the bullet that will kill you has not been manufactured yet. The arrow that will pierce your skin has not been molded yet. The battle that will spell your doom has not been summoned yet. Those who are placing orders for your casket and digging your grave are wasting their time, are wasting their energy, and they are wasting their money. Ha, ah, like my friend used to say, the news of your death is greatly exaggerated. My friends, you will live. You will not die. Let this be your declaration in spite of what your dream says. Let this be your declaration in spite of what your body says. 
Let this be your declaration. In spite of what your doctors say, in spite of what your enemies whisper, in spite of what your fears whisper, in spite of what your unbelief whispers, your depressed spirit, demons and devils, say it loud and clear. Aha! I shall not die, but I shall live. No matter how many enemies confront you and affront you, there may be multitudes against you and very few for you. Hold on to the assurance of David today. I shall not die. I shall live. Do you realize that God honored his declaration? Yes, he did. You can hear David saying, in spite of the likes of Goliath, in spite of King Saul, in spite of wicked Absalom, in spite of the 27 battles I fought in my life, not counting the lions, not counting the bears, I shall not die. Even when I sinned and I was sick, God did not let me die. He spanked me, he rebuked me, he punished me, but he did not let death touch me. I sinned and he whipped me, but God told death to leave me alone. Yes, I sinned and I was corrected, but not with the weapon of death. He chastised me, but he won't give me over to death. I was in big trouble, but he said, death, get back and don't touch David. Don't put your hand around him. My friends, I shall live, I shall not die. And do you realize he fought so many battles, but not a single battle killed him. He died in a good old age on his own bed. Do you realize there were 42 kings that ruled in Israel and in Judah? Of those kings, 15 were killed by other people. God himself killed three, and two killed himself. But David was not in the number. I don't know what is threatening you right now as I go off the air. Just relax and say to yourself, ha ha, I shall not die. I shall live. I shall live to declare the work someday and the power and the glory of God Almighty. I think I have to stop here because time is telling me I got to go off the air. But before I go, I need to bless you. I bless you in the name of the Lord. I pray that whatever the enemies are saying to you and they are saying concerning you will amount to nothing in your life. I decree for you, God will watch over you. And God will give you insights into what the enemy is saying and what the enemy is doing so you can be protected. I wish you long life and I pray that you will not die in the hand of the enemy. Anyone born of a woman, they will not be the ones to send you to an early grave. I decree that for you in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, in the name of the Holy Spirit. And all God's people all over the world said amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much for joining me today. We'll be back again next week. Until then, this is Bishop saying, stay safe. Bye-bye.